In Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 7 we find an important end time message and it reads And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters so who is this God that the angel is lovingly warning the world to turn to and worship notice that this message references God as him so who is he In John chapter 4 we have an interesting conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. The Samaritan woman asked Jesus concerning the place where God is to be worshipped, and listen to how Jesus replies. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Let me just pause there for a moment. Jesus tells the woman that she doesn't know what or who she worships but he says we speaking of the Jewish nation know what we worship and look at how Jesus responds to one of the scribes in Mark chapter 12 Jesus was asked the question which is the first commandment look how Jesus responds and Jesus answered him the first of all the commandments is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the scribe says, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. That's interesting. Let us go back to the woman at the well. Jesus continues to reveal the truth to the woman. He says, The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So who is the God which we are called to give glory to and to worship in Revelation 14? Who is the God which created heaven and earth? Let's look at some more Bible verses. In John 17, while praying to the Father, Jesus said, Father, this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. I have glorified Thee on the earth. John said in 1 John 5.20, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ this speaking of the father this is the true God and eternal life now notice what the Apostle Paul confirmed in 1 Corinthians 8 and do not miss this he said As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one, meaning singular. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, meaning plural, but to us, There is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, 
and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Can you see who the none other God but one is? It's the Father, according to Paul. Paul says again in Philippians 2 verse 11, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of who? To the glory of God the Father. So who is he who is to receive our worship and to receive glory as the angel in Revelation 14 calls for? It is God the Father, the one true God according to Jesus and the Apostles. Just look through the writings of the Apostles and you will see them refer time and time again to the one true God as being the Father. Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. James says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. John says, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Now many Trinitarians will be saying, Ah, that's all very well, but in Genesis 1 it refers to God as us, showing a plural God. And Jesus said in Matthew 28 to baptize in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, showing a plural God. And 1 John 5 7 says that there are three which bear record in heaven, the Father, Word and Holy Spirit, again showing a plural God made up of three beings. This is the common stance of Trinitarians, so let us deal with each of these points. In Genesis 1 we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now this is a lot more simple than many take it to read. The question is, who is God and who is the us? Well, we have already established who God is and will further cement this truth later on. God is the Father. But did the Father create this world on his own? No, clearly not. So who did he create this world with? Let us use scripture to answer this. In Ephesians 3 we read, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So who is the God who is speaking? It is God the Father. And who is he speaking to? His Son Jesus. This is the us in Genesis 1. It is the Father and Son. And through the Father's own divine spirit, which he shares with his Son, which I will show you from scripture later, they created this world together. Ah, I hear some Trinitarians say, but the Hebrew word for God in Genesis 1 is Elohim, and that means a plural of persons. Well, let's look at another verse in the Bible that uses the word Elohim. In Exodus 7, when God is speaking to Moses, he tells Moses that he will be a God unto Pharaoh. And the Hebrew word for God in this verse is exactly the same as the one used in Genesis 1, Elohim. So was God telling Moses that he was going to appear as three persons before Pharaoh? No, of course not. So what was God telling Moses when he said Moses was going to be an Elohim to Pharaoh? God was simply saying that Moses would appear great before Pharaoh, and this is what Elohim means. It is not a plurality of persons, but a plurality of majesty, 
a position of greatness. This is how Moses was to appear to Pharaoh, and this is also why Elohim is used for God the Father in Genesis 1. It is telling us of the Father's greatness and majesty. Just look how David spoke of this in 1 Chronicles 29. In 1 Chronicles 29 we read, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee, and praise thy glorious name. Can you see the plural of majesty proclaimed of God the Father here? This is why he is called Elohim in Genesis 1. It is not saying that God is made up of three beings. It is saying he has a position of great majesty. And the fact that Moses was also to appear as an Elohim to Pharaoh proves this. Now let us deal with Matthew 28, 19 and 1 John 5, 7. In Matthew 28, 19 we read, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And in 1 John 5, 7 we read, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now I'm not going to make any case here about the validity of those verses, even though there is strong evidence that they are added verses, as the majority of people just will not accept this. But if you would like to look into this, then please visit the pages on the screen now for more information. So here, let us deal with these verses as if they are inspired. Now the first important point to note is, that neither of these verses mentions the word God. So what does that mean? It means that neither of these verses are telling us who God is. Now something else you can do is go and look up the phrases God the Son and God the Holy Spirit in the Bible and see if you can find them. And I will tell you now that you won't find those phrases once in the Bible. Why? because the Bible tells us that the one true God is the Father. An important point to note regarding Matthew 28.19 is the fact that if it is inspired, then none of the disciples did what Jesus supposedly commanded here, because not one mention of baptism in the New Testament was performed in the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They were all done in the name of Jesus alone as you can see on the screen. And an important point regarding 1 John 5, 7 is that according to Jesus in John 8, there are not three that bear witness, but only two, himself and God the Father. So the question remains, who are these three mentioned in Matthew 28 and 1 John 5, 7? What should a good Bible student do? Go to the Bible and let the scriptures interpret themselves. So let us do just that. Who is the Father? In Matthew 11:25 we read, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. So Jesus confirms that the Father is Lord of heaven and earth, the one to whom the angel of Revelation 14 is pointing us to. In John 17, we read Jesus saying, Father, this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. 
So Jesus confirms that the Father is the only one true God. In John 20:17, we read, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So Jesus confirms here that the Father is both his Father and God, and our Father and God. In 1 Corinthians 8.6 we read, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So Paul confirms that the Father is the one God of all. These and many other Bible verses confirm that the Father is the one and only true God, Lord of heaven and earth. Who is the Son? John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In 1 John 1 we read, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16 we read, He, Jesus, saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Romans 8.3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God send in his own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now look at what God the Father says himself on the Mount of Transfiguration as Peter was speaking. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, this is my beloved Son, hear him. These and many other Bible verses show that the Son, or Word, is Jesus Christ, the Son of the one true God, the Father. Now many Trinitarians will say, yes, that's what I believe. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. But many fail to realize that the Trinity God teaching says Jesus is God himself, and not the literal Son of God. And yes, we will deal with what John won a little later. As you can see from this quote, the Trinity doctrine teaches that Jesus is only the Son in a symbolic way, not the real Son of God. It teaches that Jesus never had a beginning, and has always existed alongside the Father. And if this is true, then Jesus cannot be the true Son of God, and yet the Bible reveals him as just that, the real, true, literal Son of God the Father. So let us look at the biblical evidence for Jesus being the literal, begotten Son of God the Father before he came to this earth. Now to begin with, let us establish an important biblical principle that we should all heed. Apart from some prophetic writings, God's word is to be taken literally as it reads. For instance, in John 3.16 and Romans 8.3, it says that God gave his only begotten Son, and that God sent his own Son. Now for God to give his Son, and to be able to send his own Son, what does God the Father need to have to be able to give and send? 
he needs to have a son in the first place. This is basic logic and this is how we are to take God's word literally as it reads. So let us look at some Bible verses concerning this. In Micah 5, given a prophecy of Jesus coming to this earth, look at what it says. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now if you look at the original Hebrew root for goings forth, you will see it means to literally go out from or proceed from. So this prophecy is confirming that Jesus came out of or proceeded from something sometime in eternity past. Now look at what it says in Proverbs 8, speaking of wisdom, which it is well accepted that this is speaking of Jesus Christ. But just to confirm, the Apostle Paul also confirmed in 1 Corinthians 1.24 that Christ is the wisdom of God. Proverbs 8 says, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. So Christ revealed through Solomon and Micah that before anything was made by God the Father, some time in eternity past, Christ came forth from the Father as a true Son. Now did Jesus confirm this at all in the New Testament? Yes, he did. In John 16 we read, For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And in John 17 we read, Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. For I have given unto them the words which you gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they believed that you did send me. So Jesus confirms himself that he came out of God. Now some say that Jesus here is just confirming that he came from God to this earth. But no, look at the clear order Jesus is confirming. He says he came forth from the Father and then came to this world, speaking of two separate events. In Proverbs 30 we also read, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Wow, so the Bible does confirm clearly that Jesus came forth from the Father some time in eternity past as a true son, and that people knew God had a son even before Jesus came to earth. Just look at what King Nebuchadnezzar said regarding the fourth person in the fiery furnace. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now did you know that God the Father spoke audibly twice to the people in the New Testament? And what did he choose to say on both occasions? He said, This is my beloved Son. Now God could have said anything, yet chose to confirm both times that Jesus is in fact his beloved son. 
And if we say that Jesus isn't really God's literal son, like the Trinity God doctrine teaches, then we are saying that God the Father is a liar.